You know, I was, yeah, I was wondering actually if I could stand down there. Is that like allowed? Okay, for a guest speaker to do that? Yes, yes. All right, all right, good. Well, you know, some congregations have, you know, issues and things. So, all right, you want me to be comfortable, that's, that's good. I appreciate that. All right, thanks a lot. Part of it is, you know, you may not be San Francisco 49er fans. So you don't need to stare at that the whole morning. I'm actually not a San Francisco 49ers fan, but I am a fan of Craigslist, and that's where I got the computer. So. So it really is good to be back with you, and I, and I mean that. You know, I, when, we're back on tour, when we're back on home assignment, my family, my wife is here, Terry. She just nodded and raised her hand, not high enough for you to be able to see it. There you go. And next to her is Hannah, right there. And uh, so, and we have three other children. Jonathan is back up in Cary right now. He's 17, and our uh, oldest son, Timothy, is 19, and he's in Germany in university. And our oldest daughter, Rachel, is 22, and she's out in northwest Arkansas right now. She just graduated from university out there. Uh, but uh, at any rate, so when we're home, I go around and I speak in lots of different Christian Missionary Alliance churches, as you might imagine. And uh, as I look back four years ago when, I was, when we were back home the last time, uh, visited lots of different churches, primarily in, in our district, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. And, you know, I, I don't say this to every church. You're probably thinking, well, you say it to 99% of the churches. I don't say it to 99% of the churches. I say, I say it to very few churches that I really, really remember you guys. I, I, I had been to this church, I think our brother had said I've been here a few times. I, I think I'd only been here once before in my life. That was back in the 1990s. And I don't remember much about the church uh, back then. But the three things that stand out from the last time I was here, the first one was... Uh, this, the, a brick building and a white blob. <laughs> that stood out to me. You know, I was wondering, this is a new church growth model, you know? Uh, I don't see other churches doing it this way. Let's, let's, let's see. And then I walked in, and the place was just full of life, full of life and energy. And uh, I've, I've even experienced that this morning already, just with a few people. Ashley, I think was welcoming me when I came in, handed me a flyer, didn't, you know, didn't do the old, here's a flyer for another worship service. <laughs> Hello, I'm Ashley. You know, welcome to our church. Just very, very lively. And then up uh, when we were having some prayer up before, before the time, and I just, I just sensed that again. So that's, that's so encouraging. You may say, well, it's the body of Christ, right? Aren't all Alliance churches that way? Yeah, you've been in other Alliance churches. They're, they're not all that way. Neither are all Baptist churches or Presbyterian or other ones. So this is a special thing you guys have going here. And then uh, the third thing I remember primarily, and of, of course I remember the Freemans, uh, Van and Wendy and their family, because I knew them back up in Cary 20 years ago before they uh, ditched us and moved down, down here. So they're all, that's always special as well. But the third one I was thinking of was Bill Jewell. And uh, we, uh, I don't know, I, I do know some of the reasons, but we just kind of hit it off seemingly to me right away. And I, I was able to see him just uh, a few, uh, several days ago at men's retreat, as the brother was talking about. It was good to catch up with Bill some. And, you know, to be, just to open my heart with you, I, I was sad. I was sad when I got back here and heard that Bill was no longer with you guys. I was tempted, no joke, I was tempted to think, and I think I said it out loud in my office, what did he do? I can't believe he left that congregation to go up to a district office position. Now, don't tell him that. Uh, but I trust it's the Lord's will. I'm sure Bill and his wife and family prayed about it, prayed about it with the elders here and different people in the district office. And, you know, he'll, in, in one sense, he'll have a much larger influence you know, being at the, at the district level. I, I trust that that's, that's, that's what will happen. But, uh, you know, I was, I, was, I was saddened by that. I was saddened for you all because he's, he's a special guy. And I'm sure your other elders, Van, you know, other people are very, very special as well. But 
I, I, because I had made that personal relationship with Bill, I thought, wow, if I got, if I got to meet Bill Jewell like once or twice, and I, I felt that special bond, wow, imagine having him week in, week out, a uh, sp special guy. And then I thought, as I was preparing this message, I, message, I thought, you know, you all probably have to deal with, you know, the sad goodbyes a lot more than maybe other churches do uh, in other towns because you're a military town. I remember I was at the Goldsboro Church as well, and they have to, have to deal with that as well, the comings and goings and things like this that, uh, that other, other churches in other towns probably don't have to deal with. And so it reminds me of a verse that the Apostle Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26. I think that's our first slide, at least I hope it is. And it says, you know, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. So you get that a lot, right? Bill Jewell's a good example. Bill left you, that's a sad thing, but Bill was honored, right? Asked to be there at the district office. That's a real honor for someone. You get to rejoice with him even in your sadness. What I'd like to do this morning is to look at the larger passage in which this verse is found and talk some about the body life of the church, the interactions among different groups and different individuals in the body of Christ. And the Apostle Paul uses an illustration of the body, like the human body, as he describes it, a very peculiar illustration. And this, this, this body metaphor was used widely uh, in the ancient world to describe how different organizations should function and every part should help each other and things like that. Uh, but the Apostle Paul is something unusual where he has different body parts talking to one another. So he takes it to that, to that other level. So we begin by reading here in verse 12. And we'll just move through those slides till we get uh, to the end, to verse 27. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be, there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Now, this passage in its context, if you are familiar with it, speaks first and foremost to the issue of spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are those special endowments, those special capacities that the Spirit brings with him to individual believers as he inhabits a believer uh, when the person becomes a Christian, as they are baptized in the Spirit at conversion. And each believer has one of these endowments or capacities at least. And we're not told that the spiritual gift is always with a person. Uh, we're told that there, we should pray for the greater gifts, for instance. And so there are times where we might say that a spiritual gift might come upon a person for a, a certain amount of time. If maybe they're entering into a new role, 
And so they need special giftings for that, and the, the Holy Spirit can equip them. So it's not necessarily that it's a lifelong thing or necessarily that it's a temporary type of thing. But these are these capacities that the Holy Spirit gives you, gives to each one of us. Many of them are what we might consider mundane. They are the sorts of things that find a counterpart in the world, such as teaching or leadership or administration. But then, of course, some of the gifts are rather unusual. Sometimes we call them miraculous. Sometimes we call them supernatural, things like being able to prophesy or being able to uh, speak in different tongues, unknown languages, or maybe the ability to heal when you're not a doctor, things like that. And so the temptation, of course, for the Corinthians was to consider that the more unusual gifts were more important than the other gifts that were more mundane. Now, can you believe this church 2,000 years ago, this fleshly church, that would be so mesmerized and caught up by flashy sorts of things that they'd be tempted to think that those are more important than other mundane gifts? We never have to deal with that, do we, in our day, right? No, of course not, and not, especially none of you. Right? No, of course, we'd never be tempted by that. We all just have this perfectly spiritual understanding that all of us function exactly the way God wants us. And all those things we see by the TV preachers or by that charismatic church down the road, none of that influences us at all. We're neither drawn toward it, nor do we curse it at our, in our beds at night. We don't do any of that, right? That's right. So we're all tempted, just like the Corinthians were, to do that, to look at one another, you know, and we all have that tendency anyway. I sometimes wonder, and this is no joke, I sometimes wonder when I'm thinking about sins and sinful tendencies. It's easy for me to think about man's, men's, male sins and sinful tendencies. You know why? Of course, because I'm a guy. And it's often hard for me to think, you know, what do women struggle with? But my mom has told me, and I think my wife has told me as well, that women struggle a lot of times, a lot more than guys do, with cattiness, you know? I'll go to a, I would go to a party with my girlfriend before my present wife, <laughs> let's just say. And, uh, no, I am joking. And uh, I'd come home from the party and think, wow, that was great, great food. You know, got to hang out with some of the guys. It was a great time. <laughs> And the woman I was with, you know, would have a temptation to say, well, I noticed this, and this, and this, and this. And all this high-level, subtle communication, female communication going on, unbeknownst to clueless males. And, you know, different, as I said, communications, not all of it good, you know, wearing, wearing this dress, it's probably meant this by that, or this by that, or... Did you hear what she said here? Yeah, I heard that. Well, this is what she really meant by that. She did? I didn't. I thought she meant what she said. No, of course not. She didn't. <laughs> really? Wow. There's like, you guys are like speaking in tongues. You can understand these different things. I can't understand. So in the congregation, I'm sure, you know, we're human beings. We, have, we already have natural tendencies, you know, to want to judge one another, to think, oh, think, oh that, that person's higher than I am, or or I'm higher than that person, or whatever it might be. And then you have this added layer of the fact that the Lord enables us, gives us these different giftings, and also then puts us in different roles, uh, oftentimes according to our giftings, and so we can judge uh, one another that way. And, of course, unfortunately think that only some of the gifts are supernatural. So if someone has the gift of teaching or leadership, you say, ah, oh, yeah, well, whatever. You know, they, they might have been a good teacher or leader, even if they weren't a believer. So that's not special. But this person, have you heard them speak in tongues? Oh, I wish I had that. Did you hear them prophesy? I cannot believe that's so special. And we just fail to realize that every one of them, every one of the gifts, every capacity the Lord's given us, he's given us, he's considered each one of us, considered the role he wants us to play in our local body, and has given us that gift or that set of gifts for just his own purposes and reasons. And they're all supernatural and all to be valued to the same degree. So these Corinthians were struggling with this issue. And there were basically two sets of people that the Apostle Paul highlights in this passage. 
The first set of people, two sets of possibilities for how we can wrongly consider this. The first group is mentioned in verses 15 and 16. And so I think hopefully we have a slide for that. And this is the mentality that the spiritual abilities the Lord has given us are so lowly and worthless compared with someone else's gifts that we actually, we think to ourselves, I don't even belong in the church. I'm not even a, I'm not even a member of this church. And so we read, now if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. Now, you know, at one level, this kind of thinking sounds really humble, doesn't it? Nice and humble. You know what? I'm going to take the high road. Because I'm not gifted the way brother or sister so-and-so is, I'm going to just sit down and become passive and let them take over. Doesn't that sound really good? That sounds really nice. And I want to be careful here. I want to be careful here because there's probably a number of people in any cross-section of a congregation, probably some of you like that, thinking that right now. I want to tell you, that's rubbish. That is rubbish. It's arrogance. It might be an introverted personality with a touch of laziness thrown in as well. Okay? That kind of thinking, of thinking, you know what, uh, it's, an, it's really an excuse. I can bow out because I'm already naturally that kind of person who doesn't want to confront or doesn't want to engage anyway, and so I can just kind of, and nobody will notice. And I'll just continue it to exist decade after decade, taking up a pew and not being active because I don't have this, that, or the other gift. Now, if I were a really bold guest preacher, which I'm not, some people think I am, my wife does sometimes, or I, I could ask you, if you were honest, to raise your hand. I'm not going to, okay, so I'm not asking that. I could ask you to raise your hand and say, you know, if you're gut honest, are you that kind of person? Have you been doing that much of your life? Now, you might not have thought of it as being an arrogant, prideful position, but it really is. And why is it? Because the Apostle Paul continues on. And this is what he says in the very next verse as he explains this kind of position or mentality. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, and we mentioned this a moment ago, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? So far from an attitude of humility, this basically says it looks God straight in the face and says, what you gave me is worthless compared to what they have. My, maybe my personality, my way, all, all the things together, including the gifts, are worthless. And therefore, I'm just going to sit here by the side. If you'd given me something special, then I might be more tempted to be active in the congregation. So it's, it's looking God in the face and judging God and saying, you didn't give me what you gave other people. So I'll just sit off here by the side. As I said, I wanted to be gentle with you. So that's the kind of gentle way to say it to you. But there's an opposite kind of attitude as well that the Apostle Paul addresses here as well. And those people, they're more obvious sometimes. They think that their capacity is so great compared to everybody else's that they don't need those other kind of people. It would be just great if the whole church just was about me. Yeah. Uh, have you ever seen that YouTube uh, video? Who's that guy, the me monster? The uh, Hannah, who's the guy, the, uh, the uh, comedian? Okay, none of you have seen that. <laughs> you need to Google the me monster, or you need to YouTube the me monster. Okay, sometimes that, uh, that works, but sometimes that falls flat on its face like it just did. <laughs> that happens. It's not a, not a big problem. Okay, so we have this kind of attitude where people consider that uh, their kind of gifts are special, so special that the others don't need it. And so we see this in the next uh, passage. So Paul writes about this attitude in verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. Now his reasoning here is slightly different. He doesn't just attack them for their pride and arrogance, perhaps because that was so obvious uh, to everyone 
uh, thinking about this. But he observes that there are parts in the human body that we normally cover up and hide. And he says, you know, if you think about it, we don't hide those things because they're less important. We hide them for modesty's sake, but it's not because those parts are less important. They're actually critically important to the human body, but we cover them up for other reasons. Normally, you might think, well, the things that are up front and, and out front, those are the most important things. And the things that are hidden away, done behind the scenes, they're not so important. And so we judge things that way. I was just at the men's retreat again. And uh, our guys from our church, actually, this year, were doing the sound and all the audiovisual stuff. There were like six, six guys back there the whole time doing this. And I, I went back and I thanked them at one point, and I said, and I, I told them, but I thought, also thought to myself, you know, the guys who were up there in front, you know, speaking to the 350 or however many guys were there, you know, yeah, they put in time preparing their message, but a lot of those guys, they have these messages that they've done many, many times, and they might go around from conference to conference and things like that, and they show up, and they do their thing, and they, they're all mic'd up, and they're out in front, and everybody remembers their name. But who's thinking about John with the long beard, you know, running sound back there? You know, Oftentimes, we don't think about that. He's back there behind the scenes. Now, John may perfectly enjoy, I know lots of sound guys like being behind the scenes, and they don't ever like being mentioned by the guy up front uh, and called out because they really enjoy that position. But John's very active. The point is, we might think, oh, yeah, John's back there. Who, who's running sound today? It doesn't even matter if they have a name. Just is somebody running sound. Yeah, but who's preaching? And what's, what's the deal with that, right? Like, that's so bizarre. That's so against what God, what the Lord, the apostle is saying in this passage here. Each one has a part to play. And this is just, we're, we're just talking right now just about this tiny little thing called the worship service on Sunday morning, which is like, what, and one hour out of your entire week. It's just t a tiny little piece of the body life of the church. So there is then also this temptation as well to, uh, to judge and to think that one uh, one gift is more important than the other, and to, to not consider each other the way the Holy Spirit would have us to do it. Now, these two, these two positions or these two mentalities feed each other in a vicious cycle, don't they? The passive people, or the people with the gifts that they consider not really even worthy to be, be belonging to the body of Christ, in one sense... They're perfectly happy for the more aggressive people or the people who have the more uh, outward or uh, miraculous, whatever you want to call them, spiritual gifts, to take over and lead even more. And the people who have the more outward gifts or the, the gifts that are more flashy or flamboyant, they're all too happy to have them take a lesser and lesser seat in the congregation. So this sort of thing can feed uh, can feed itself to the point where you have just a few people in the church doing, in a sense, most of, of the activities in the church. And that often is the case. I remember when I was in seminary, there was the 80-20 rule, and I think it still holds. 20% uh, of the congregation does 80% of the work. You know? And I'm not just saying work. I'm just I'm talking body life in terms of interactions, in terms of all the different things that are supposed to go on. Uh, and characterize uh, a local church. I wonder sometimes if an illustration of the reality of this situation isn't found in the evangelical church movement. I'm sure if I sat down with one of you who knows the church scene here in Fayetteville, and I said, because I know it in Cary a little bit, if I said, uh, okay, which churches are known as the teaching churches? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah you've got this one over here, you know. First Baptist, yeah, that's whatever. That Presbyterian church are usually good teaching church if it's, if it's an evangelical one. Blah, blah, blah. There'd be three or four. You'd be able to reel off, oh, yeah, they're, they're guys on TV. He's a really good teacher and this sort of thing. Okay, is that where the charismatic people are? No, no. They're never in the teaching churches. That's right. All right, where are the charismatic churches? Oh, that's that monstrous thing over there. And it's this Pentecostal thing over there. And it's this thing over here. Are they of teaching? Nobody goes there for teaching. They go there for life and spiritual stuff that's going on. Did you just see the other day somebody was healed there and this guy was speaking in tongues and this and he's on the TV for, not for his teaching, for 
giving money to them or getting miracles from them or whatever it might be type of thing. That's, that's that crowd. Okay. Oh, oh that's interesting. Okay. Uh, do, does the teaching church, are they really into like community service? Eh, eh, not, not, they're not known for that. Really. How about the charismatics? Eh, not really. No, you want that? Oh, we got this section of churches over here. They're really into that. They're not, they're, they're not flat. They don't speak in tongues, you know. And their teaching is just all right. But man, they're always out doing stuff. You know, they're just known for that. It's just the way it is, isn't it? Yeah, it's probably that way in Fayetteville. It's, it's that way in Cary. It's that way in a lot of places. And I wonder sometimes if that isn't because, not because anybody intends for it, okay? I'm not saying anybody's like going out saying, I'm going to segregate the churches or whatever type of stuff like that. But because, let's say a charismatic person shows up in a church where teaching, teaching the word, teaching the word, that's, that's what we do. Charismatic, that's like out of the box for a lot of the teaching place. Like it just doesn't even fit. Even if it shows up on the radar screen as being legitimate, there's just no real place for it in the church, for it to manifest itself. Like, so nobody's going to say, you don't belong here. In some churches they will, but in most churches they wouldn't. They say, but the person's just going to feel, you know what, there's, uh, there's no one else like me in this church. <laughs> there's no place for me really in this church. And then they show up at the charismatic church, and everybody's doing that, or at least a lot, a lot higher percentage. There's a big place for me. I'll go here. Okay? And a teacher person shows up in a whatever kind of church, and it's like, oh, this is horrific teaching. I can't believe these people are this, that interpret the Word of God this way. It's so lame the way they do this. But people are all driven by their experience. They don't really want to be driven by the, the, the hard sometimes teaching of the Word of God, the accurate teaching of the Word of God. Well, this, this person can go over to PCUSA or PC, uh, PCA church, you know, Presbyterian Church of America, conservative Presbyterian church. Man, he'll fit right in there or she'll fit right in there. Some sort of men's or ladies Bible study or maybe an assistant pastor or something like that. The word, the word, the word, and we could go on, right? So I wonder sometimes if that isn't what's going on partially, again, not intentionally, but uh, what's going on in our, in, even in our local churches. Now, as we head toward the conclusion, and I'm serious about that. Uh, I do want us to shift into slightly a different direction because we've been talking about spiritual gifts. And in this passage, actually, uh, the Apostle Paul doesn't just use this illustration for spiritual gifts. If you remember, uh, toward the very beginning in verse 13 of the passage, he actually brings in a whole other set of different groups within the church. So, you know, you can look at the church through different lenses. You could look at the church through the spiritual gift lens and say this group of people has a gift of teaching, this group of people has a gift of tongues, this group of people has this, has that. That's one lens. You could take that lens out, put another lens in and say this part of the church is Jewish, this part of the church is Gentile, this part of the church is slave, and this part of the church is free. That's another lens, a legitimate lens. So he says that in verse 13. We were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or or free. But the Apostle Paul also has other lenses that he pops in sometimes. We can look at through another lens and we can look at gender relationships or we can look at age group relationships. So he talks about male men and women. He call, talks about husbands and wives. He talks about parents and children. He talks about older men and younger men. He talks about older women and younger women. Those are other lenses we can look at. And I want us to just for the next several minutes conclude by considering uh, 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 one of these categories, or actually the relationship of one of these categories to other categories in the church. And that has to do, it relates to age groupings. And the one I want to consider is how the older folks in the church relate to the younger folks in the church. Now, as I look around, there's a, a decent mix, a pretty, actually, I'd say there's a really good mix here in this, in this congregation. I was just up in West, Western Pennsylvania, and there's a lot of churches up there that are kind of older, you know, mostly, mostly older people as I'd look at in the congregation. But this is a really good mix here. I see lots of younger people. That's a compliment. You know, and I see uh, lots of older people. That's a compliment, too, you know. Uh, i got to keep it, keep it all even here. And uh, there's lots of mid-range uh, people here as well. And uh, so we've got we to ask the question... Are we kind of siloed off regarding age group things? What I mean by that is, you know, like in business lingo these days, they talk about siloing, where you might have a big business 
and uh, different groups within the, within the business or even in our government sometimes are kind of siloed off one from another. So where there should be all sorts of interaction and, and uh, interconnection between and communication between the different groups kind of keep to themselves, don't share information with other groups the way they're supposed to, and therefore it hinders uh, the, the growth of the, of the business. And that can go on in the church as well. So a question would be, what, are the, what is the relationship of the older folks? I'm going to say older. Let's take an age. Somebody throw out an age so it's not me who said it. 50? I just turned 50. Come on. Can't be that. Let's take it a little up. It's 51. No, it's got to be 51. Come on. No, no. 50 is a new 28. Now, so uh, we'll go with like 65. Sorry. I know I just offended some people, and some people are breathing easier. So we'll say 65 and all, or somewhere in that, in that range. And there's, there's some folks here, I can tell, you know, who are in that range. Praise God. So the question is, what interaction do those folks have with the folks in their 20s, 30s, 40s? And also, what relationship do they have with the teenagers? I, 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 like I, I don't know if I mentioned, I just came back from six weeks of being up in western Pennsylvania. Visited 15, 16 churches up there. Spoke in lots of different churches, lots of different groups of people, including the teens and the middling people and the older people as well. And very often it seemed, and it, it, I think this largely goes on in my home church as well, the older people are to do old person things. And they're, they're to hang out with themselves. Okay? So it reminds me a little bit of the way the world does it. The world, let's say there's like you know, one of those bell curves. Okay? And so let's say a person's coming up, they go through college, they're in their 20s, they're ramping up in terms of the world. They might be working in some business or in some specialty at least, maybe different businesses. And they reach their peak late 20s through maybe early 50s, and boy, the business world loves them there. Yeah, it loves them there. That's their peak efficiency. Then they get in their early 50s, and they start sliding off the board, you know. And uh, the business world basically says, you know, it's been really nice having you. We got this, maybe we have this retirement package for you, maybe we don't. But in any case, it's time for you to head off, you know, and move to Florida or something like that. And it seems to me we often do that in the church as well. The older people, now there are some older people who are supposed to be elders. Okay? And so we have this category where we keep some of the older people as elders. But for the rest of the older people, very often the, it's unspoken. And I think in most churches it's unintentional. But it's this basic idea of, hey, you're older now. That's really great. I, I know you have these times you get together with your older people groups. You know, and you, and you talk about old people things, you know, and the different aches and pains you're doing, different medicines you're on, <laughs> different uh, activities you're doing with other older people, your plans for what you're going to do, you know, when you actually retire or, you know, when you get older, you're going to be moving to Florida. Which retirement center are you going to? Or, you know, you're going to live near your kids. It's all kind of old person speak. Now, I don't know if that goes on here. You guys may have this perfectly integrated thing, and I'm just the next five or seven minutes is going to bore you to tears. Or at least there'll be information about what other churches sometimes do. Okay? And then, then I think to myself, wow, you know, what, what a waste. How many of you have been walking with, and I do want you to raise your hands now. This is a serious question. And I'm not asking how many of you have lived perfect Christian lives. I'm talking how many of you have been walking with the Lord, even on again, off again sometimes, for more than five years? Raise your hand. Hi. Okay. Higher van. That's good. Okay. How about 10 years? 20? 30? Really, van? I remember you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 30 years. Keep them up. Okay. That's, that's, that's a good percent. 40 years. Really? Okay. I'll take your word for it. 40 years. Keep them up. I want to see. I know it's hard if you've been walking with her for 40 years to keep your arm up that long. 40 years. That's really good. <laughs> Okay, 40, that's a significant number in here. And if I went 50, some of you might not want to, but you, if you're honest, you'd raise your, your hand. 40 years of walking 
with Jesus Christ. What do you think that's worth? Can that be replicated? That can't be replicated, except for, guess what? Walking for 40 years with Jesus Christ. What do you, what do you 40 year badge members, what do you think about that? Do you ever think about that? Or do you just think of your life as kind of the way the world might be thinking of it? I'm getting old. I'm, become, I'm becoming less, less useful. What? Somebody actually answered. That was good. Who said that? A lot of grace. A lot, a lot of grace. Okay, a lot of grace from God, exactly. But I mean, vis a vis the, the rest of the congregation. It's tempting to think, well, yeah, yeah, I guess I've been walking with the Lord for 40 years, but basically I'm getting older. You know, I'm getting more wrinkly. I have less energy. It seems like I'm, you know, not as active in the church as more, and I don't hear invitations and things to do stuff. Maybe I'm just, you know, like the business world and just, you know, People aren't thinking about it, but I'm basically being offloaded, basically. What you have is priceless, that kind of experience. There, there, there are 20-somethings. How old are you? 39. <laughs> Messed up on that one. <laughs> All right. There are some people who are younger, okay? You got the teenagers. There's some godly, hopefully godly teenagers here. They're not wise. They might be a wise 18-year-old but they don't have the wisdom of a 55 or a 75 year old who's been walking with the Lord for 40 years. They cannot. It's no slam on a, on a 27 year old newly married guy or woman or with new kids that they don't, that guy doesn't know how to be a husband or that gal doesn't know how to be a wife. They can't know. They can't actually know how to do it yet because they haven't walked through it. They can't know how to be a godly parent. They can take godly steps and sorts of things like that. But what, are the, what do we normally do in an evangelical church? Say, okay, you're, a, you're newlyweds. Well, guess what? We have a video series for you where older people are going to talk to you about how to be a godly husband and wife. That's how we watch them. Yeah, that's really great on the DVD. And it is awesome. All the time ignoring the fact that you have people in your own midst that you can actually have a relationship with you who can walk with you and talk with you and ache with you about what it means to be a new husband or a new wife. And then a few years down the road, I got kids now. When's, we need a video series on how to raise kids. Pastor or elders, great. Okay, we've got to set up this room. Here's the video. That's great. All the time, they're the old people. They're often in old people class talking about old people stuff, you know, siloed off. When you say, could, could you... Can you talk to me? I've got, I got this little baby. I don't know what to do with this thing. How do, I, how do I do this? Well, this is what I did. Really? And you build this relationship. i got this teenager. It's driving me nuts. Crazy. <laughs> Things like wild off the deep end. My other kids are normal. And then I get this freakazoid. What am I supposed to do with this kid? <laughs> you know what? I had one just like that. I had one just like that. And I talked to somebody 40 years ago. They really helped. They gave me some advice about that. Here, let's talk. Let's go for coffee or something. So our time's... Ending here, I just want to challenge you as, as we leave. We've been talking about this body life thing, spiritual gifts. We could talk about ethnic groups and things like that. But what I want to leave you with is this, is this issue of how the different generations are interacting with one another. I'm not saying, I know there's some churches that are big into the family thing. Like you got to do everything as a family. You can never break up. You can never have a youth group. You can never have this, that. Every, everything's got to be family-based. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about more in general. When you ask yourselves as individuals, when you ask yourselves as a body, let's say the leaders of the church, what is the intentional interaction, like set up and structured into the fabric of the church that helps to promote these sorts of relationships? How strong are those webs? Or is it just a hit or, hit or miss type of thing? I close with this illustration. My, we live in Russia most of the time, and... To my, I've never heard of a retirement center in Russia. In Russia, the men die on average when they're 59 or 60, and the women when they're 73 or 74. So there are babushkas, not babushkas, babushkas all over the place in, Saint, in Russia, in St. Petersburg, where we live. See them all over the place. You, who you don't see all over the place are dedushkas. You've never even heard of that word. That's grandfathers. Because 59 or 60, on average, they're dead. And what you all like never see is a lone dedushka walking around. 
Because when you have the situation of a Diedrushka who has just lost his wife, as far as I know, he's immediately swarmed by all these babushkas, you know, who haven't had their husband for a while. And for whatever reason, they want another man. Uh, okay, but the point is, you don't see retirement. So what typically happens, the, old, the older man dies, and the mother then, the grandmother, or the in-law, immediately gets recycled back into her, one of her kids' families. Why is she there? She has a very important role to play. She is going to continue peeling potatoes and carrots, and her thick fingers are going to get even thicker as she gets older, as she works. She's going to be doing this. Lots of families still use the you know, washing boards and things like that in Russia. And she's going to help raise the kids. They're going to get grandmother wisdom day in and day out. Why? Because the two parents are often out working somewhere. And that lady will do that until she dies. Never has a retirement. Never gets to sit by the side and play cards with other old people and then get shuffled into the three levels of the retirement center type of thing. Never gets to do that. But you know what she also never gets? She also never gets to feel alone and worthless and useless. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this congregation. I thank you that you have called them, each one of them, out of darkness and into your marvelous light. I thank you that you have placed them here in this particular congregation. You have given each one of them the gifts that you so intend for just this moment in their lives that they can participate and strengthen and encourage and challenge the rest of the congregation exactly as you have planned. I pray that you would help each one here and them as a, as a group to rejoice, to rejoice in everything that you have given to each one of them individually. You've given them their health that they have right now. You've given them their gender that they have right now. You've given them their life experiences that they have right now. You've given them the gifts that they have right now. And you've given them all the other ones around them to neatly fit out this particular beautiful expression of the body of Christ. And I pray that over the ensuing weeks and months and years that, that this beautiful flower, this beautiful body would continue to function more and more as a healthy, beautiful expression of your life being lived out in them. Lord Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen.